Hello everyone, uh, this is another video from uh, my law firm, Unisoft Law Professional Corporation. We're meeting with a, another professional today and uh, we're going to talk about real estate litigation. Uh, our guest's name is Neil Wilson and uh, he is a lawyer here in Toronto, he's a litigator. Uh, I think he uh, has practiced law for uh, at least nine years now, maybe maybe a little bit longer. And how do I know that? Because we went to law school with Neil and we got called at the same time. So I celebrated nine years of my uh, practice and I'm sure he did as well. So I'll pass the floor to my friend Neil and uh, let him introduce himself and his firm. Thanks, Pulat, and morning, uh, and uh, ho hope you're doing well. Uh, so as you said, my name is Neil Wilson. I'm a litigation lawyer in Toronto at uh, the firm of Stevenson Welton LLP. And we are a litigation boutique firm, which means that civil litigation is uh, all that we do. And one of our uh, uh, practice areas is real estate litigation, which is what we'll be speaking about this morning. Great. Thanks, Neil. Uh, real estate litigation. So uh, I assume most people are familiar with real estate, but uh, hopefully few people are familiar with real estate litigation. Can you tell us why real estate litigation happens? What exactly goes wrong? What are the major issues that arise in real estate transactions? Well, there, there are many different types of real estate disputes that can occur. And in many ways, it's similar to contract litigation or, or disputes over contracts because often real estate disputes turn on a contract, an agreement to purchase a piece of property, an agreement to lease a purchase a piece of property, uh, et cetera. Uh, some of the big issues that will come up in real estate litigation are uh, often number one disputes about closings. So somebody agrees to buy a piece of land from somebody else and either through the fault of the person buying the land or through the fault of the person selling the land or both, the transaction doesn't close, the deal doesn't go through and uh, 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 sometimes the litigators are left to pick up the pieces when there's a dispute about what happens when that, that deal doesn't happily go through. Uh, another area where there are commonly disputes is if there's a purchase that does go through and there are disputes about the property itself, was somebody told something about the property uh, uh, that wasn't true? Is there a problem with the property where the purchaser is not satisfied with it? Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, the uh, last one uh, is also referred to as uh, hidden defects, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yes. Okay. So you talked about uh, people not doing what they have to do under the transaction. Um, in my experience, it's very common that uh, the purchaser usually will, uh, will default, uh, at least in real estate transactions. And by the way, before we get into that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm just going to throw things out there and I will let you uh, correct them as our guest expert today. Uh, the parties to a real estate transaction are usually referred as the vendor uh, and the purchaser. So uh, those are the terms of art. Uh, the vendor is also known as the seller and the purchaser or as the buyer. Uh, uh, that's what uh, regular people probably call them, but for our intents and purposes, let's refer to them as the vendor and, and uh, uh, the purchaser. So in my experience, in real estate transactions, for example, uh, purchasers um, are the common uh, culprits in, in defaults, uh, not always, but commonly. Would you please cover that uh, area for our audience? What happens when a purchaser defaults? How a purchaser can default? What uh, issues arise and what are the consequences? Right, well, we'll pull that out. As you point out, either side can default. So either the purchaser can default by, for example, not having the money to close or perhaps not being willing to close if the purchaser feels there has been a huge decline in the market value of the property. Uh, uh, on the other hand, the vendor could refuse to close because they decide they don't want to sell the property anymore because they think there is um, uh, uh, you know, some likelihood that the purchaser is not going to close, etc. Uh, what, what happens as a practical matter when the purchaser fails to close uh, 
is are two things. Uh, number one, the purchaser in most cases, if the purchaser is at fault and the vendor was what we call ready, willing, and able to close the transaction, the purchaser is going to lose their deposit. And so that deposit will typically be forfeited to the vendor of the property. Um, and the second important thing that can happen depending on what uh, has happened with the market value of the property between the time of the agreement to buy the property and the closing date is that the purchaser could be liable for the difference between the purchase price of the property and the market value of the property as of the date of the closing or the period after the closing. Mm -hmm. Didn't we have this situation a couple of years ago when the Toronto real estate market, re residential real estate market crashed and uh, some purchasers tried to get out of, of their deals? Do you remember that? Yes, yes. And so that, I mean, it, it, I mean, it's very cyclical. So that, I mean, happens from time to time. Certainly it happened a couple of years ago with the uh, uh, adjustment in the, the, the market values then. Um, but I mean, it, it, it can happen for many reasons. It can happen for uh, the reason of the purchaser wasn't able to get a mortgage commitment or uh, 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 had some other issue with performing their obligations on the agreement to purchase the property. Right, right. And uh, I, I think we're still feeling the, uh, the uh, ripple effect uh, of that, uh, I, I'm trying to get back to that uh, real estate crash. It was a really fascinating phenomenon. Fascinating phenomenon. We're still feeling the ripple effects. I think some cases are still ongoing. Uh, let's say, uh, imagine uh, uh, there is a purchaser uh, back then, and uh, they signed the agreement of purchase and sale, and. Uh, and then the market just crashes and they signed on buying something that's not worth that amount of money anymore. In fact, it's worth much less. And uh, they just drop out. Uh, the vendor, of course, accuses uh, the purchaser of uh, a breach of contract. Uh, this is technically a default by the purchaser. What defenses are available to the purchaser in a situation like this? You know, uh, uh, we, we don't really care about the motives here of the purchaser, whether he is not uh, happy with the value of the property is irrelevant. Just uh, for the sake of argument, what defenses are available to a, a purchaser in a situation like that? Well, Pulat, the, the short answer is there aren't a whole lot of defenses available because the, the, it's, it's, it's intended to be and it should be a pretty predictable area of the law where if the purchaser is in default and doesn't comply with their obligations, then the consequences are the, the, what we've spoken about, which is liability for any decrease in the market value of the property, carrying costs for the property, uh, et cetera. Uh, the, probably uh, uh, two of the most common defenses that would be available to a purchaser in, in, in the right cases. Number one, there was some problem with the performance by the vendor. So purchaser didn't have the money, purchaser didn't tender the money on the closing date, but there was also a default by the vendor. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was that vacant possession wasn't available. Uh, maybe it was that uh, the, the, the house wasn't built yet if it's a new home. Uh, or uh, uh, maybe it's that one of the uh, conditions in the agreement wasn't satisfied. So that's the first area would be looking for something that the vendor did wrong themselves of uh, sufficient importance that it was also a breach by the vendor as of the closing date. Uh, the, the, the second uh, point that's often raised is uh, what we call mitigation. So did when the vendor resold the property, if the vendor resold the property, did, did the vendor take appropriate steps to what we call mitigate or reduce their damages? So did they properly list the property? Did they uh, take appropriate steps to sell the property at the highest possible value? And that's an argument that is often raised. Typically, if the property has been resold on the open market, 
that's a pretty good indicator of what the fair market value of the, pro of the property was at the time. So maybe the purchaser would uh, seek to retain an expert to say, no, 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 that, that, that wasn't fair market value. The property was worth X uh, on the date it was sold and it should have been sold by a price. So that's another area uh, that, that the parties uh, uh, might create a dispute to, between the parties about what the damages are as a result of a purchaser's default. Neil, in connection with the defenses raised by purchasers um, in claims of, of, of default by purchasers um, uh, or purchasers' defaults, you mentioned one of the defenses is failure to mitigate. Uh, I have a practice question in that regard. The burden of proof uh, of, of those defenses on the party who's raising it, correct? Correct, that's right. Right, so it is the purchaser that will have to uh, lead evidence of uh, failure to mitigate. And in this particular example of failure to uh, sell at market value, am I right? Yes, and so there, there I mean, there, there are two ways uh, that a, a, a purchaser who's in default could, could attempt to do that. Uh, one is through an expert opinion. So retaining an expert, so for example, a realtor or an appraiser, someone with experience of, of the values of real estate in the area where the property is, to say, wait a minute, during that period of time, the value of the property was X, or the similar properties in the area were valued at X. Um, another way to go about it which, which people sometimes do without raising an expert is saying, look, I've looked at the listings. I've looked at the other similar properties in the neighborhood. These other properties went for a price in the same period of time, significantly higher than what the vendor resold it for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then of course, if uh, the defendant, the purchaser in this case, leads expert evidence on property value, then it is prudent for the plaintiff, uh, the vendor, to respond with his or her own expert report. Would you say that's, that's the case? I, I mean, I, I, I'd say it's very case specific, so it may be prudent in some cases, but the reality is that if somebody has uh, listed the property on the open market, mm -hmm. uh, you know, had a, come, a few people come through and look at it, received offers, Mm -hmm. taking the best offer that they could achieve at the time in order mm -hmm. to resell the property, it's going to be very challenging for mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the first purchaser to be in a position to say that those steps weren't reasonable. Right. So basically, if the vendor listens to his real estate agent and his real estate agent is competent or her real estate agent is competent and they do what uh, an ordinary uh, vendor would do in the circumstances in the market, then uh, the vendor is probably going to be okay on that it, defense. It, I'd say it would be an uphill battle for the other party. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's very interesting. You talked about closing dates. Would you say more uh, about the importance of closing dates and timing in general in real estate transactions? Well, the timing, uh, timing pull out is, is extremely important in real estate transactions. And that's because the closing dates uh, generally, unless parties agree to move them, are firm and the party's obligations have to be performed on the closing date. So if the closing date for a certain piece of property is, uh, say, today's date, July 8th, and the time for closing, say, is 5 p.m., that means that all of, of, of each party's obligations have to be performed by 5 p.m., and that includes, uh, of course, the, the most uh, important obligation by the purchaser, paying the price of the property. Uh, uh, to the vendor. And so that means five o'clock. It, it doesn't mean the next day. It doesn't mean 515. It doesn't even mean you know, 502. Uh, the timelines are, uh, are, are firm and it's, it's, it's a concept that we call time of the essence. Time and the essence. The, uh, generally for real estate agreements, time will be of the essence and it's essential for both parties to perform their obligations by the date that's set or risk being in default of the agreement. Now, of course, as a practical matter, if there hasn't been any huge shift in the value of a property and money comes in at 515, probably both parties are going to say that's fine and they're not going to raise a dispute about it. Uh, 
uh, but the obligation is to 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 perform both parties to perform all of their obligations by the time set in the parties agreement when you speak of time and its essence and fundamental contractual conditions like this and how they can make or break a deal it makes me think of of uh, the role of solicitors uh, who generally are the only lawyers on on a deal on a residential real estate transactions nobody comes to real, a residential real estate transaction with a litigator so i wonder at what stage would you say a solicitor should contact a litigator well, typically, in my experience, solicitors will will refer their client to a litigator or will call a litigator when it appears that there's going to be a dispute between the parties. And so, sometimes that can be prior to closing. Sometimes that can be, you know, at closing or very shortly after closing, at the closing date if it doesn't close. But really, whenever uh, there is kind of the writing on the wall that there's going to be a dispute, a lawsuit, a fight between these two parties that is not going to be resolvable through correspondence back and forth between the real estate solicitors. Right. And uh, of course, correspondence between solicitors as a matter of practice for litigators is admissible evidence usually, right? Yes, it'll, it'll, it'll be evidence of what the positions the parties took uh, with, and, and you know, if, if, if things were agreed to, conditions were waived, uh, things were accepted, et cetera. Um, uh, when when things come to litigation, you know. Speaking of uh, advisors and uh, evidence, and speaking of things advisors draft, I can't help um, considering all these schedules to agreements of purchase and sale drafted by real estate agents. I mean, I'm sure you've seen that a share of those in your practice. So uh, and. Uh, we know that real estate agents draft schedules A and schedules B, and they use templates. And I think it's a good point to introduce the question of professional liability of real estate agents and uh, the role of real estate agents in uh, real estate litigation. What do you have to say about that, Neil? Well, I mean, the, the role of real estate agents is to provide, uh, you know, advice and representation to the standard of care of a of a of a uh, competent real estate agent to their clients, um, and that that would include, you know, explaining the effect of the agreement, explaining uh, uh, what's what's being agreed to, the key terms of the agreement. Uh, often, we'll see in real estate litigation uh, cases where once things have gone to a dispute. Often if parties are looking for somebody to blame, in some cases, that blame will be shifted towards the real estate agent. And so that can be something uh, as simple as, you didn't explain this to me, this isn't what I understood, this isn't what I agreed to, and people naming their potentially their own realtor and having that, uh, that, that uh, individual in their brokerage involved in a litigation dispute. Uh, the other way that that realtors uh, sometimes some, some uh, in some circumstances need to come, become involved is disputes against uh, with respect to deposits. So typically, when there's a fight about a deposit after a failed closing, uh, most realtors will require either the consent of the parties directing what the realtor is to do with the deposit, if it's to be returned to the purchaser, if it's to be forfeited to uh, the uh, the vendor. Uh, or a court order prior to, prior to releasing that deposit. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, it's very interesting. Real estate agents play a, a special role. I mean, when people buy and sell real estate, they re residential real estate, of course, and I'm talking about an average person, they don't usually deal with lawyers much. And even the solicitor, uh, their role is often restricted to confirming title, right? So, um, and, and in this respect, just like any professional, would you say that the prudent practice for real estate agents is to uh, keep records, put things in writing when they get instructions, 
you know, all the usual things that other professionals do in their practice to protect their clients and to protect themselves would probably apply to real estate agents. This is my understanding. Do you think it makes sense? I mean, real real estate agents aren't held, obviously, to the same standard as lawyers in terms of things like uh, letter writing, memos to file, recording every single thing that happens, um, and and uh, probably for good reason. But but I, I think that the best answer is that it's it's important to have that communication to make sure that there are no misunderstandings and to make sure that both sides of the agreement understand exactly what is being agreed to and understand the consequences if the parties don't fulfill their obligations in what they're agreeing to do and some of the consequences that we spoke about earlier in terms of uh, defaulting on an agreement to buy or sell a piece of land. Right. Speaking of lawyers and lawyers practice, you know, once a litigator is on the file, um, Let's talk about their role and let's talk about what good litigators do in files like that. So um, what are the top three uh, practice issues, in your opinion, that are important to keep track of in residential, let's say residential real estate litigation files? Um. The, 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 the top three things to, to, uh, that, are, that are notable about the, the area, I would say, is number one is it, it's an area where uh, there, it, 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 it has a, the potential to be resolved by way of a summary judgment motion. And so typically, if there is a default in, by a purchaser, by a vendor, if the default is clear, if there aren't any material facts in dispute, and if it's something where the damages have crystallized and can be assessed because the property has been resold, uh, that, in my view, would typically be something that is appropriate for summary judgment. And so summary judgment motions are common in the scenario that you've described um, and can be actually a very effective way to bring the litigation to a close uh, relatively quickly and cost effectively. Um, I, I'd say the other issue to be aware of is there are different kinds of motions that may arise as a result of an anticipated closing that's coming up where there's a dispute about the property and who has an interest in the property. And that's where we get in, would get into a discussion of what's called a motion for a certificate of pending litigation or CPL, which is essentially a motion for something that goes on title to the property to indicate that the plaintiff, the person seeking the CPL, has claimed an interest to the land. And typically that, that uh, person's interest will be, will, what they're claiming will need to be resolved or somehow dealt with before a closing happens to another party. Thank you for raising the CPL. It's a really interesting area. Would you say that to, for, for the purchaser for uh, being a plaintiff now, to uh, register a CPL, uh, the property must be unique. The, the purchaser must have some sort of specific interest in this property, but not merely in, in damages. That, that's right. So the, the most uh, 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 common reason for seeking a CPL is that a purchaser has a claim to what we call specific performance. Uh, and specific performance, uh, in, in short, is it's I don't want damages. I don't want money as a result of this. I want what I bargained for, which is I want that property right there, the one that's important to me, the one that I want to close on. And so uh, in order to get an order for specific performance, one of the most important factors is to show that the property is unique. So you can't just go over to the next subdivision and buy an identical home in a similar neighborhood uh, and then sue and fight over the damages that accrued as a result of you doing that. It's this property is unique to me and it's important to me for these reasons. Mm -hmm. So that's part of what the test is for specific performance. And that is a very important uh, uh, factor that's considered on a motion for a CPL. And uh, of course, that motion can be brought ex parte. That is without notice to the vendor. It, it can be brought ex parte. I mean, there's there are different uh, you know different views on on what the pros and cons are of doing that. Of course, if you bring a motion ex parte, 
there's a uh, an extremely high obligation of candor and full and fair disclosure of everything to do with the case, including the other side's position to the court. Um, and if that, that if not fulfilled, that alone is grounds for the party, once they do receive notice of the CPL, coming back to court and saying, this wasn't disclosed, that wasn't disclosed, could have changed mm. the decision, please remove the CPL. Um, so my, my uh, you know, general view on that subject is if a CPL is required a short notice period at, or a, a, you know, a quick turnaround time where things are urgent is in many cases the more prudent course unless there is a real and valid concern that the property is about to be dissipated or sold if notice is given to the other side. Right, right. Um, very good. Thank you. Thank you for those uh, very interesting points about litigation practice. Uh, just to r wrap up, I was wondering about any uh, differences between residential and commercial uh, real estate litigation. So one that comes to mind is probably in commercial uh, transactions, um, parties are m perhaps more sophisticated or have better legal or more legal advice. Are there other things that come to mind? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it would be not necessarily be the, the quality of the legal advice, but perhaps the sophistication of the parties or how familiar the parties are with the court process or with litigation generally. Um, and the other thing that plays into that is, is of course, cost. Because as, as, as disputes become uh, bigger and there are larger numbers involved, the legal costs become less of a concern than it would be if, for example, you're fighting over a $100,000 deposit and everybody is burning money through litigation and there's just an immediate imperative that the thing has to be resolved because the economics don't make sense to, to, to litigate it. Um, right. Typically in, in, in uh, cases of, of residential disputes, this may be the first time that somebody is involved in litigation and can be very stressful, litigation can be uncomfortable, uh, versus a situation where if it's a large commercial transaction and it's a business deal and it's sophisticated parties who are familiar with uh, you know both real estate deals and with litigation it, it 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 can create a very different flavor for the litigation uh, neil thank you so much any final words for our audience on real estate litigation um uh, no i just say it's a it's, it's an interesting practice area i'd, I'd encourage if, if anybody has uh, questions you can feel free to reach me uh, uh, my, uh, our, our firm's phone number is 416-599-7900, and you can reach me at nwilson at swlawyers.ca. Fantastic. And uh, to our audience, remember, uh, there was no legal advice in this video today. If you want legal advice about your specific situation, Neil would be a great uh, person to talk to. Uh, I thank him for his time today. Thank you so much, Neil. I really enjoyed this conversation. And uh, I hope to have you back uh, on our show. <laughs> and uh, I uh, wish you to be safe and healthy in this time and all the best. And same to you, Poulet. It was a, an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. Thanks.